uh, first of all, uh, all money on the earth, well, let's go back to the Roman Empire. Go back in the Roman Empire, it was, it was basically stated in ancient Rome that there were only two things on the earth, uh, land and water. And therefore, there were two kinds of law to be established on this earth, the law of the land and the law of water. Brilliant. That's all there is is land or water. So the law of the land, and people have heard that term, the law of the land, but you don't realize when you use the term law of the land, it's to differentiate between the law of the land as opposed to the law of the sea, the law of the ocean. That's why you use that term, law of the land, because there's another law that dominates the earth. It's called the law of the ocean, the law of the sea. The law of the land is obviously the law of the people who live on a particular piece of land. As, as many countries as there are, or as many cities as there are, that's how many laws of the land there is, because the, the law of the land is different in South Africa than it is in, in, in America. You can do things in China you cannot do in, in Egypt. You can do things in America you can't do in Australia because of the law of the land. The land is where the people live, so it's the law of the custom of the people who live on that particular piece of land. They have decided for themselves what their, what their customs will be. And when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So if you're going to go to Australia, you're going to go to South Africa, you're going to go to Egypt, you better learn what they can do and what they can't do. And if you don't like it, then you go back home where you can do what you want to do. But if you're in somebody else's country, you have to abide by their custom, the law of the land. Now, there is another law called the law of the sea, the law of the ocean. That is the banking law, because you can get a credit card in America and go to China and live pretty well and go vacation. Or you can get a credit card in, in Africa, in South Africa, and go to China on vacation and eat very well and live very well and go on a vacation. Why? Because it doesn't have anything to do with the custom of the people. We're talking money, period. It's just money. One law of the sea, water. So we say in America, money goes through your hands like water. No, money is water. Maritime Admiralty Law of England. The law of the sea is the law of banking. Banking law is referred to as the law of the sea. Therefore, let me explain to you. When a ship pulls into harbor... Uh, we may have talked about this before, but it's important, so we need to hear it again. When a ship pulls into a harbor, first of all, you need to understand, according to international law, all ships are female. There is no such a thing as a male ship. All ships, by law, are female. That's why you will hear captains say, she's a good ship, and she's been seaworthy. She's this and she's that. All captains will refer to their ship, rocket ship, Sailing ship, doesn't matter what kind of airship, the captain calls his plane she. She's a good ship. She's seaworthy. Why? Because all ships by law are considered female. Reason why? Because all ships, any kind of a ship, delivers a product. And so the idea goes back into the ancient ancient world of, of Samaria, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, where the idea was the male manufactures, but the female produces the product. So therefore, we humans were manufactured, <laughs> but your mother was in labor and in the delivery room because she was building a product and giving birth to a product. Therefore, when a ship pulls into a harbor, she parks at the dock. And where she parks at the dock, she ties off a rope onto the dock to hold her in her berth. Every item coming off of that ship from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world, doesn't <coughs> matter, we're talking business, we're talking banking. Any, any odd item on that ship coming off that ship must have something called a certificate of manifest because yesterday the ship wasn't here, 
But today, we come to work, and there's a ship here from Japan or from China with $800 million worth of televisions or whatever. Uh, so it has manifested. $800 million worth of business is waiting for you at the dock. So therefore, every item coming off that ship, because it's manifested, must have a, what is called a certificate of manifest, meaning every piece has coming off that ship has to be accounted for. How much does it weigh? What color was it? Does it have four doors, two doors, uh, air conditioning? No. What color? And so every item coming off the ship must have its own certificate of manifest. Why? Because it was brought in, she brought it in on water, and she is in her birth. So therefore, each item has to have what is called a birth certificate a certificate of manifest because she is sitting in her birth, B-E-R-T-H, a birth certificate. Therefore, when your mother gave birth to you, you came down her birth canal when her water broke. And therefore, you come out into the world as a maritime admiralty product. You came out of water down the canal. Therefore, you have to have a birth certificate. A certificate of manifest, because last night you weren't here. This morning you're here. You manifested. So we got to know, how much did you weigh? The hospital has to say, how much you weigh? What color was he? Did he have five fingers? Yes. <laughs> Why? Because you are considered a maritime admiralty product, because she was in labor building you after your father manufactured so once you begin to see how the commercial world works, you are nothing more than a product, a maritime admiralty product to be bought and sold, and therefore you have to have a birth certificate. Now, if you're taking one of those cars or TVs off of the ship and it drops down accidentally and breaks, you just lost money. You can't sell that one and make any money off of it. That's okay. Things like that happen, okay? And there's no problem with that in, in commerce. If you break something, it's so no problem. We take that off of our taxes. You know, there's, a, there's a loss. But you have to have a death certificate. And it's got to be signed by the dock. Why? Because that's what the damn thing fell and broke was at the dock. So the dock has to sign your birth certificate. And if you and if you die there, if you then he has to sign your death certificate. And we better make sure that the doctor is not lying about the death certificate. Because if you're lying about the death certificate, that you, that's prison time for a doctor. You don't want to lie. Did, did this person, was he, was he born dead? Yes. Prove it. Sign the paper and put your life on the line as a doctor and tell me that this person died at birth. And if we find out you're lying, because now he doesn't have to pay taxes, he doesn't have to be under government control, he's totally free because we don't know anything about him, and we find out you're lying, that's a felony for doctors. You go to jail for that. So therefore, doctors will have to sign your birth certificate. They have to sign your death certificate. Why? Because you are a maritime admiralty product. Your mother created you after you were manufactured. You were created, and she was in her labor. She was in labor in the delivery room because she was delivering you as a product. And that's why in your birth certificate on the bottom, on the right-hand bottom of the birth certificate where your mother or father signed, look at it. Look on the birth certificate. It doesn't say mother or father. It doesn't say parent. Where your mother and father signed, it says informant. Your mother and father was informing the corporation that the new television has just arrived in America, or a new car, a new automobile has just arrived that you didn't know about. So it's called an informant. Now, on the left side of your birth certificate, on the very bottom, you will see in small print the birth certificate is the property of the United States Commerce Department, Department of Commerce. Why? It's because your birth certificate is a commercial document. It's on actual banking. Uh, uh, paper. It's on banking paper. It's, con it's considered a stock, just like a stock certificate. So once you understand that you are 
that's why if you say uh, if your son's getting married or your daughter's getting married and she's marrying a very wealthy, you know, marrying into an extremely wealthy family, we say, well, you know, her, her fiancé, she's marrying, he's of good stock. What do you mean? She's marrying a pig or marrying, or marrying a, 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 a horse? No, because all humans are considered stock. That's why if you're going to, <laughs> it's an incredible story about how we are maritime admiralty stock. We are like a stockyard. That's why all, uh, uh, you know, when we were growing up as kids in America, all houses and homes always had a yard, a front yard and a backyard. That's for your children to play in because it was a stockyard. And we still have stockyards today. That's why you, 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 you're creating a product for the commercial world that we live in, and so to protect the, the product, you put you give them a backyard to play in. So it's called a stockyard. You're signed over, when you're born here in this country, you're signed over to the United States, not the United States of America. There's a world of difference between the sun and the moon, between wet and dry, between up and down. Right. Opposites, well, there's a big difference between United States or United States of America. Doesn't mean the same thing at all. United States of America is one thing. United States is totally different than the United States of America. That's the point that most people don't know anything about. So when you use the term United States, you're not talking about the United States of America, the 50 collective 50 states in the federal union. United States is not the 50 states. United States is a totally different entity completely. The United no. States of America was founded in 1776 as a, as a constitutional republic, but that was done away with in 1871. We're no longer living in the United States of America. As of 1871, we are now living in something called the United States. This is why once a year, United States is considered not a country. United States of America is a country. It's a confederation of states, which we call the federal enclave, the federal states, the, the, the federal republic. But the United States by itself is a company, it's a corporation, incorporated in 1871. A group of men got together after the Civil War and incorporated a company. You can form a corporation. But if you form a corporation, then you are now under corporate law. You can't do certain things you could do as an individual. Now you're a corporation. But, of course, you get certain perks as a corporation, too. So there's some good and there's some bad. There's some up and there's some down. Now, you, you can, certain things you can do now as a corporation you couldn't do as a, as, by yourself. So corporation is a business. Well, anybody can form a corporation. But if you form a corporation... As I said, you're under corporate law, which means the first thing right off the bat is that you have to have, according to corporate law, a president of the corporation. You also have to have, according to the law, a vice president of the corporation. And you also have to have a secretary treasurer, at least those three things you have to have if you're going to have a corporation. So today we have a president, we have a vice president, we have a secretary treasurer of a corporation a privately owned company, a corporation. And the corporation was incorporated in Delaware in 1871. As a privately owned company, 1871 Corporation Incorporated called United States Corporation has nothing to do whatsoever with the United States of America founded in, 18, in 1776. No, nothing to do with that at all. Privately owned corporation called United States Corporation <clears throat> incorporated in 1871, it is now considered to be a corporation, okay? Now, the point being is that according to the corporate law, anyone who would work for that corporation would be referred to as a citizen of that corporation. So today, if you walk into any business in America and you say, and they ask you in the bank or ask you in the, if you're applying for a job or anything, they ask you, are you a U.S. citizen? And you say, yes, I'm a U.S. citizen. You think what they're asking you, and a good attorney, a federal attorney, uh, would tell you in court, I'm going to ask you a question. But before you answer, think about what I'm going to ask you. The judge is listening, the court's listening, and this is all on the oath. I'm going to ask you a question. 
Be careful what you answer, the way you answer. Are you of your own volition, out of your own mouth, testifying that you are a U.S. citizen? Now, don't answer until you thought of, or think about it, because whatever you say, you can go to prison. So are you a U.S. citizen? And you say, well, what he's asking me is, am I lawful and legal to be in America? Yes, I'm a U.S. citizen. Good. Now you're going to jail because you no longer have any rights or protections on the law because a U.S. citizen is, a, is an employee of a privately owned company. You have no jurisdiction. There is no jurisdiction to protect you under the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. That's an American, not a U.S. citizen. So, therefore, there's a world of difference between a United States citizen and an American United States of America. Because the United States of America, there was no U.S. citizenship. There was state citizenships. You were a citizen of the state in which you were living. That's why today, in 1871, after the Civil War, there was a privately owned company established called United States Corporation. And in that, they stipulated that anyone who would work for that corporation that was founded as a company, corporation, would be called a citizen. So today, if someone says, are you a U.S. citizen, and you say yes, what that means is that you have testified with your own, uh, out of your own mouth that you are an, an employee of a foreign corporation because it's foreign to any state because a United States corporation is not, is not in any one of the states, so it's a foreign corporation. It's a place called Washington, D.C., and Washington, D.C. is not one of the states of America. So therefore, it's a foreign corporation. It's in a particular area called District of Columbia. District of Columbia is not a state. District of Columbia is an all as 10 miles square where the corporation operates from. But it's not in Maryland. It's not in Virginia. It's not in New York. It's a whole area that has its own flag, its own laws, its own jurisdiction, has nothing to do with the, with the 50 states of the union. So the point being is that Today, if you say that you are a U.S. citizen, what you are saying in law, in any courtroom, what you're saying is that you are an employee of a foreign corporation. Foreign corporations are perfectly fine in any state. You know, all kinds of countries have corporations in America. In California, we're filled with corporations from all over the world, corporations from, from automobile companies. Japan has corporations here. Africa has corporations. It's all right. That's fine. It's just business. As long as you remember that California's boss and you pay up front and you, and you have to tell California how much your corporation's buying and selling and you have to pay taxes from your corporation. But as long as you're, you're doing the business of the corporation, you can operate anywhere. As long as you pay your, pay your dues, as long as you pay your taxes. The corporation called United States is operating in a place called Washington, D.C., which is not a part of America. It has its own flag, the Washington, D.C. flag, which is, has its own jurisdiction, its own police department. It has nothing to do with the 50 states of the Union at all. So what it amounts to is, uh, you know, if you want to try and understand it this way, if you have a building, if you have a, uh, uh, what do they call them, condos, if you have a condominium building with condos and there's 50 condos in the building or 51, 51 units in the building, well, 50 of those uh, units are sold to individuals, all right? The people who buy the, those 50 uh, condos, they own their condo. They are not renting. They own it. Therefore, you have no jurisdiction over that condo. They own that condo. Therefore, the condo unit, all 50 people agree that somebody needs to be responsible for running this 50-unit building. Somebody's going to make sure the trash gets taken out, the pool gets clean, uh, to clean the yards, and if there's any breakdown or any problem with plumbing, somebody's got to be responsible in this building for the building. So we will all pay a little bit of money every month. Every condo pays a little bit, and we will appoint somebody to be in charge of maintenance for the building. 
and he's responsible to make sure that the trash is picked up, the pool is cleaned up, and if there's any problem with the electrical or, or plumbing or anything, he's responsible. And we all pay him, and he's responsible to make sure everything works right. So therefore, that would be Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. is like a separate entity. It has nothing to do with all the condos. That's their business. They own it. That's all he's doing. And therefore, he's paid by them to work for them. Well, what it turns out to be, after a while, the guy who is the property manager, who's being paid by those 50 different uh, condo owners, he begins to think of himself not as a property manager. He's God. He could do anything. He's in charge of the building. He's in charge of the pool. He's in charge of trash. That means he's actually God. He's in charge of everything. So now he can go in and walk into your condo anytime he wants because he's in charge. And he can tell you what paint, what color you can paint your walls. He can tell you how many people you can have over as guests. He can tell you anything he wants because he is God. He's been elected, and he's the boss of all bosses. Well, that's what's happened. Today, Washington, D.C. thinks it's God. It's based on the old Roman idea of the concept of, the, of Caesar being Augustus of Tiberius Caesar is God. And therefore, the Washington, D.C., as I said, uh, you know, before the country was found, it was called Rome. And the Capitol building is identically based off of the uh, off of the Vatican dome, Domus. And uh, so, what we've got now is the Holy Roman Empire. And the Holy Roman Empire. Go back in the history, and look and ask the question in history. Go back to the re uh, reference books on the Roman Empire and find out where did Caesar rule Rome from. Caesar was emperor of Rome, and Rome dominated all of Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Caesar dominated Rome, and Rome dominated Europe. And so, therefore, where did Caesar rule Rome from? He ruled Rome from, there was, uh, Rome is called the city of seven hills. And he ruled Rome from something called Capitoline Hill, which was actually Capitol Hill. That's in Roman history. So Caesar ruled the empire from Capitol Hill. And it was said in history books that where Caesar each morning, quote, the reference book says, quote, he would go up on the hill, end quote, to officiate as Caesar before the Roman Senate. So therefore, Rome had a Senate. Where? Up on the hill. What hill? Capitol Hill. Sounds familiar? And so today we still have Caesar, who believes himself to be God, incarnated Jehovah. He is absolute God over the entire Roman Empire. So All people must come and bow down to Caesar. Bow down and, and sprinkle incense on the altar of Caesar because he represents Jehovah God. He represents the almighty God of the universe. He is the emperor of the world. I'm just saying that today... The president of the United States is considered to be the emperor of the universe. All people should bow down and sing praises to him and sing all and beat themselves on sackcloth and ashes and be aware that he represents God. He is the absolute authority over everything. So all of this nonsense about America being the land of the free and the home of the brave, that went out in 1871. It's gone. From here on out, you're under the Roman dictatorship out of Vatican Rome, and that's why today when the Pope comes here to America, you see George Bush running out and kissing the ring, all the politicians, left and right wing politicians, communists, Nazis, fascists, doesn't matter who they are, they all run out and kiss the Pope's ring because America is the new Rome. What is going on here today is not against the Constitution. It's not against the Declaration of Independence. It's not against the law. If you go to work at Sears or General Motors or any corporation, they tell you when you can go to work. You, you show up here at 7 o'clock, not 7, 10, 7 o'clock. You take a break at 10 o'clock. You take another break at 3, and you're not asking questions. We're telling you. And here's what you're going to do. Here's, what, here's the job you're going to be assigned to. Now, do you want the job or don't you? If you don't like it, that's all right. Hit the street. 
We'll get somebody who does want it. So the point being is that what General Motors is doing to you, telling you when you can come in, when you can go home, when you can take a break, you ask permission if you want to go to the bathroom, if you want to take a break, you ask permission. You don't just pick a, get up and walk off the job. So the point being is that they own you for that eight hours or nine hours you're at work. They own you. You live by their rules. As long as you're inside that corporation working, they're the boss, not you. So, therefore, if you say you're a U.S. citizen, you are, in fact, an employee of a foreign corporation that was in Washington, D.C., and therefore, you, it is not unlawful what they're doing. It's not illegal what they're doing. You are an employee. It's a very clever manipulation of an exploitation and a manipulation of a circumstance that happened because of the Civil War. After the Civil War, here's what I am told by people who know. I'm not the authority on anything. I'm just telling you what I've heard from e experts. When you understand that there's a world of difference between the United States of America that was founded in 1776 as a republic, as opposed to after the republic was destroyed, there was a civil war where one half of this country was killing the other half. Well, you got to understand, if you found out that Sears had a riot in Sears and one half the employees killed the other half, that's very serious. That's bloodshed. So you got to realize Sears is never going to be the same again. There ain't never going to be the same Sears we all knew and loved. It's gone. Because after that kind of a riotous bloodshed, the whole thing is going to have to be changed. We've got a whole new system of operation now because the, the old system, the old company is gone. We've got a whole new system. Why? Because the people were killing people. So the original United States of America is gone. It's over. Therefore, to say that you have, go into court and you say, well, I have certain protections. I have the Bill of Rights and I have the Constitution. There is no such a thing as a United States Constitution for a U.S. citizen. U.S. citizen means employee of a privately owned company established in 1871, okay? Employee of a privately owned company established 1871. Therefore, you are not an American national. You are a U.S. citizen. And when you go to the, to the post office to, to get the paperwork for a, a, a passport, there are two papers that you can fill out. One is white and one's green. And on the green one, uh, I am told by attorneys that on the green one they've showed me that it says if you are, are applying for a passport, but you don't want to continue to be a member of the corporation, you want to separate yourself from the United States Corporation Incorporated in 1871, then you need to get you need to sign this green paper, and then you will get a passport for an American national, not a U.S. citizen. Because it's a world of difference between being a U.S. citizen and being an American national. American national, you know, as a matter of fact, my friend Joe is a brilliant mind, government and law. is an extraordinarily brilliant guy. But he was showing me letters where uh, he was dealing with the Internal Revenue. And, uh, and he showed me the letters where the Internal Revenue said... I'm paraphrasing what, what, what was in the letter. See, basically, they said to him, the Internal Revenue said to Joe, if you're going to deal with the corporation called United States Corporation, then you deal directly with us, the, the, the Internal Revenue and the, and the Federal Reserve. But if you're going to deal with the state of California as a California state citizen, then you're dealing with the republic, which is in, founded in 1776, which has nothing to do with us at all. So if that's what you're doing as a state citizen, you are talking to us about taxes, you're talking to the wrong people. We don't have any jurisdiction over you. You need to go you need to talk to the government of the United States of America, which is in Philadelphia. Here's their phone number, here's their address, and here's where the United States of America's government actually is in Philadelphia. But if you want to deal with us as a privately owned corporation, 
called United States. Now, we are in Washington, D.C. It's called the Internal Revenue. Internal Revenue, why? Because the corporation is like General Motors, and anyone who works at General Motors, Ford Motor Company, or any big corporation, anybody working inside that corporation is internal, internal. So General Motors does not have anything to do with people outside who work for Baskin Robbins. They don't have any control over anybody except in their General Motors. They have control over. Therefore, the, the corporation called United States only has jurisdiction over those people who are their employees. That's why they have an internal revenue service. Not external for everybody. No, no, not everybody. Just those people who work for the corporation are come under internal revenue. Internal revenue, which means just about everybody is a member of a corporation. And therefore, the corporation is perfectly right in telling you what you can do and what you can't do. And they said, you can't have a house without coming to me and asking permission. Don't, don't you see there's a difference between the Statue of Liberty? You see in New York, the thing called Statue of Liberty? What do you think that means, son? You better go back to school. That's not the Statue of Freedom for America. That was given to the corporation, United States Corporation. It was given to the corporation. It's called the Statue of Liberty, not the Statue of Freedom. Statue of Liberty, the word liberty in a law book means you ask permission. If you want to take the car and borrow my car, you ask permission. You don't have liberty to just walk in and take somebody's property. You ask permission. And if I say no, that means you can't borrow. So, therefore, you ask permission. Then if I say yes, I'm giving you liberty. Liberty is what a sailor gets when he comes in off the ship at sea. He comes into a harbor. He asks permission of the captain to let him go for two days and have drinking and partying, right? If the captain says no, then you're not going anywhere. Why? Because the captain is the boss. And if he says no, you go nowhere. Why? Simple. When you're in the Navy... You are his property. You do not have freedom. You get liberty. You ask permission, and if your father says so, you can go. And when he tells you to be back at 10 o'clock, he didn't say 1030. You show up 10 minutes late, and you're in the brig. You're going to jail. Because the old man said 10 o'clock, and you showed up at 1030 drinking, you're going to jail. Because he gave you liberty up to 10 o'clock. He didn't give you liberty to 10.30. He didn't give you freedom. He gave you liberty. You asked permission. That's what the statue is called, the Statue of Liberty, meaning you ask the corporation. You have to have a, you have to have a permit. You've got to have a license. You've got to ask permission. You have to have this and that. You, know, you can't just go out and build a house without permission. Yeah, well, that's under the, well, that's under the United States of America. But you see, they change the word state, they change the word liberty, they change the word freedom, they've changed everything under the new administration in 1871. That yeah, still is a privately owned company. Not yeah. the United States of America, not the 50 states collectively. The 50 states collectively, that's the republic. All you have to do is go on the web and type in, uh, just listen to the words I'm using, write down the words I'm using, and uh, start it with, look at. I, I'm not putting myself out there on, on the air talking about BS. Go on the web and type in this. Write this down and listen to what I'm saying. Go on the web and type in U.S., then V.S., Victory Service. V.S., Victory and Service, or V.S., okay? U.S., V.S., U.S.A., so it's United States versus the United States of America, U.S. versus yeah. U.S.A. There's two different constitutions. There's a constitution of the United States, and there's a constitution for the United States. The constitution of the United States of America or the constitution for the United States. One is of the United States of America, and the other is for the United States. Of and for are two different words, two different constitutions. They read almost identically the same, but there's been a couple of little words changed in one. The corporation has changed a few words, but that's all right. 
it's okay to do that because nobody reads anyway. Since nobody reads anyway and no one has any idea what I'm talking about, that's okay because nobody's going to say anything because it has nothing to do with anything of any real important basketball or, or, or tennis or sports or anything you know, that's important to the American people. Now, who owns you and your baby and your child? Who owns you? And who can put you into prison and who can take your life? That's not important. What's, what's important to Americans is basketball. It's sports. It's the you know it's 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 entertainment. Things like who owns your body and who owns your 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 person and who owns you. Americans couldn't care less as long as they got well, plenty of beer and a lot a lot of alcohol because we do happily thank God at least in America we got a liquor store on every corner. 